I'm Dietrich Klinghardt. I'm a medical doctor. Um, I received my training in West Germany and as a young doctor already moved to the US because I love the United States. I passed my tests here and I've been licensed here since 1983 and I've been practicing here really since then but I go regularly back to Europe to both teach there and to learn what's new over there and so I'm being like a dual agent you know bringing things that I learned here back to Europe and things that I learned in Europe back to here and uh, I have a practice in Seattle uh, that specializes in the treatment of chronic illness. And uh, we sort of slowly moved up our ranks, me and the doctors that work with me. Uh, the average patient that we have has seen 23 other physicians before they've seen us. You know, so we, we're sort of like, uh, if, you, if you want, like a late stage of the journey that patients are on after they've maybe failed or have given up on other treatment modalities. And so in, in that position, we sort of were also forced to look deeply into the causes of illness. And the main thing that we discovered is that illness is not a static thing, that the foundational causes of illness are now quite different from what they were 30 years ago or 35 years ago or 40 years ago. I graduated uh, in 1975 from medical school and none of the things I've learned in medical school have prepared me for what we see now in the medical practice. I teach a lot of medical students that come through my practice, both from naturopathic schools and from traditional medical schools and osteopathic medical schools. And I am aware that the teaching in the medical schools to a large degree is lagging behind the evolution of illness. <laughs> um, like when I graduated from medical school, we didn't have a single lecture uh, in those five and a half years on chronic fatigue or on chronic pain. All the lectures were on acute pneumonia, on rare fatty acid disorders, which we never will see in our whole life as a physician. But the things that we encounter now every day we didn't have a single lecture on. And unfortunately, that hasn't changed <laughs> very much uh, since then. So uh, I want to just, uh, from the beginning, kind of say from a medical perspective, you know, there's kind of two kinds of illnesses. There's the illnesses that have a name, the traditional illnesses like diabetes or hypertension. Uh, there is fractures and there's appendicitis. And then there is the l much larger amount of illnesses that really go without a name, where the people feel they have lost their zest, they lost their enthusiasm, they lost their sex drive, uh, they lost their joy, they don't dance anymore, they don't sing anymore, they're still living, but they're living sort of like a half-life. And our experience, of course, with the patients that we see is that every patient that we see is in that category. Um, uh, the main symptom uh, if I would put it in two words, is loss of zest. You know, so the, it's not that people are suicidal, they just have lost the vibrancy of life, the color, the smells, the excitement, the sensuality of it. And we see that everywhere where we look, we see the same picture. I, I visit a lot of other colleagues and other practices, both here in the US, Canada, and in, in Europe and see the same picture there. And so we, over the years, tried to distill down what is it really that has changed in illness and what is causing this strange state that we're in, that we're observing worldwide. And we really were able to distill it down to just a few factors. The main one being people have increasing numbers of chronic infections we don't see the acute pneumonia very often or the acute staph infection. Yeah, those exist. They usually end up in a hospital and the hospitals are doing a good job with the acute stuff. But chronic infections are even denied by the medical community that they exist. Chronic Lyme disease, chronic mycoplasma infections, chronic Epstein-Barr infections. They're given sort of like a side, they're sort of like a sideline in the teaching and the 
uh, medical community and are not giving their true place because they seem to be active in almost everybody that we see. Chronic mold uh, infection, chronic parasite infestation, those things have been extremely rare when I graduated from medical school and now it's our everyday uh, discovery in our patients that are chronically ill that they have these things. And so when we look deeper, what is it that has changed in the last 15, 20 years that these chronic infections have become so prevalent? <clears throat> and what we discovered is very simple. It's the exposure to electromagnetic fields. The only, only thing that parallels the, the exponential increase in, <clears throat> in chronic neurological illness, you know, with the low-grade depression, the, the insomnia, the muscle aches and pains, and the, the fatigue, and the strange neurological symptoms with tingling, numbness, vibration in the body, the only, that, that increases exponentially. The number of children to be diagnosed autistic doubles every five years now. There's no more an issue, well, I'll be over-diagnosing it, no, it doubles every five years. The only thing that parallels that increase is the increased exposure to man-made electromagnetic fields, largely in the high-frequency range. There's some exceptions that have also increased, but largely is the high-frequency range from cell phone radiation, from the Tetra network that the police and other systems are using. Uh, the smart meters are the worst invention that, that we followed in the last two years. Uh, there's absolutely devastating consequences that I will share with you. Um, the only development that parallels the exponential increase that we observe in neurological disease is the exponential increase in exposure to man-made electromagnetic fields. So as a, as a scientist, we don't have to look very far, but neurological disease, Parkinson's, MS, ALS, autism, learning disabilities in children, behavioral problem in children, that's all exploding exponentially. And the only thing that fits from an environmental perspective and from an uh, epidemiological perspective is that this is the electromagnetic waves that are penetrating our body that are responsible for this. And fortunately enough, we have good science now over the past 80 years, more than 6,000 research studies have been published on the biological effects of electromagnetic radiation. The majority of these studies have shown biological damage being done. Of the many more recent advances in research, one notable study was published earlier this year by the University of Athens. The results over an eight-month period showed 143 proteins in the mammalian brain were altered after exposure to either a mobile phone or a decked phone base including proteins which have already been linked to Alzheimer's, glioblastoma, stress, and metabolism. Lead author Adamantia Frajipolu states, This study is anticipated to throw light in the understanding of health effects like headaches, dizziness, sleep disorders, memory disorders, brain tumors, all of them related to the function of the altered brain proteins. This permanently destroys and alters the manufacturing of these proteins meaning it completely changes the human organism permanently. The DNA inside the cell is a, a booklet, an instruction booklet, how to make proteins. And we have about 120 to 200,000 different proteins that are in the cell or in the cell wall. The receptors, you know, how the cell wall communicates with the outside environment is through proteins and inside the cell the manufacturing that each cell does of, of antibodies, of uh, neuropeptides, of hormones, of cholesterol, of building blocks that the body needs to replace, used up body parts, that's all done by proteins. Even the physical structure of your body changes. We've seen a host of people that had normal body weight for 40 years or 50 years and suddenly their weight exploded when the phone company put up the cell phone tower 200 yards from their house, not even that close, 300 yards from their house. Um, we've seen uh, cancer rates shoot up the moment the, the network of cell phone towers was established in the house. Uh, we had a, a co-worker with us, 
who had a son who was very, very sensitive to electromagnetic fields, and she lived here in Seattle, and he couldn't go to school because the schools at the time already had wireless uh, installed in the schools, and he couldn't tolerate it. So she, she moved to Portland uh, and then couldn't tolerate it there at all. <laughs> then moved over to Ashland, which claims itself to be one of the greenest city in the world. And then when she Googled the cell phone towers next to the home that she had rented, she found that within 200 yards, she had over 90 cell phone installations that were broadcasting <laughs> into her home and her son was virtually going nuts. And then she moved out in the country, decided on homeschooling and the boy's been doing well ever since.